Hi, this is Kyle with Korean Adoptive Stories with Travis. And we are here today with uh, Patrick Armstrong, another Korean adoptee. We're going to get kicking off with our, uh, I believe, our fourth episode with another Korean adoptee. Um, currently, he is kind of, uh, I believe, in the beginning stage of uh, trying to accept uh, being a Korean adoptee. And I think we'll discuss uh, about his identity stuff. I've been, uh, I listened a little bit to uh, Pat's podcast a little bit and we could probably kick off from there so pat uh how are you doing i'm doing well kyle i'm doing well travis how are you guys doing today good good so i was wondering could you uh explain to our viewers your name and your age range yeah no problem uh my name is patrick armstrong and i'm 30 years old turned 30 this past march and uh where do you live i currently live in indianapolis indiana okay so great. Uh, let's just start off uh, with asking about your adoption story. Could you explain a little bit about your family and uh, what they consist of? Absolutely. Um, I was born in March 1990 uh, in Seoul. And then in June, I was adopted, flown over to the States. Uh, and I was adopted by an all-white family in a small town called Rensselaer, Indiana. Um, about 6,000 people. Um, I also have a younger non-biological sister, also adopted from Korea. She's from Busan. Uh, she was born in 92. She arrived around then. Um, yeah, for the most part, you know, the town that I grew up in and the family that I, we grew up with was, was all white. The town, I think, is like 97% white at the time that we lived there. Um, and so growing up, we were, I think I looked it up on Wikipedia one time, 0.2% of the Asian American population in our town. So there was there was there wasn't not many uh, colored people then, uh, not even black people, or just all completely white. Uh, a, a few, a, a smattering of, of different races. Um, we had a, a few Latinx uh, uh, people that lived in the town. Um, the black community, when I when I remember growing up, barely any. Um, but it's getting a, it's diversifying a little bit more now. So you lived in Indiana, uh, Indianapolis, your entire life. Uh, you're saying then, or did you guys move around? I've moved around a little bit. Yeah, our family has been in Indiana the, uh, for my entire life uh, and even for their entire lives. Um, I've lived in not just Indianapolis, but I lived in West Lafayette. That's where I went to school. And then I lived in San Diego for a year. Uh, I lived in Chicago for two years. We actually just moved back from Chicago, my fiance and I. And then I lived in Houston for a few months um, after the hurricane in 2017. Yeah, I actually read about that. You kind of uh, got caught up in the, the hurricane around there, which we can talk a little bit about. Uh, so why did you guys uh, end up uh, moving around so much, and why did you end up coming back to your hometown? Is it because of your hometown or your family? or? Yeah, so um, it was really just me that moved. Well, I guess my sister, she lives in Salt Lake now with her husband, um, and she did a little bit of traveling. She's done a lot of travel, actually. Um, for me... I have moved around a lot, but for the most part, have stayed pretty close to somewhere in Indiana uh, to be close to my family. Uh, pretty, I'm pretty, I'm very close to my adoptive grandparents and uh, my parents as well. So I'd always really wanted to stay close to home, but not so close that I'd have to, they could walk right over. Um, they got to drive a little bit. You seem to have a really great relationship with your adoptive parents. And uh, did you guys have any other challenges or mainly it was a pretty positive experience uh, for you and your parents? Yeah, familial wise, it's been a very positive experience. Um, you know, they not only loved us a lot like their own biological kids, which they did, they, they weren't able to have any, um, which is one of the reasons they adopted, but they also were never, never treated us like we weren't who we were. They, we were the, we were part of their family, but we were never treated like oh, you're a white kid, you know, and we want you to be Americanized. Uh, when we were really little, they took us to uh, a few different um, Korean culture camps and things like that. So they, they were open and willing to uh, have us explore that side of us. For me personally, I, it just never took. I think the environment that I grew up in kept me very dismissive of my Korean heritage and identity, um, which is why I'm just now getting into that journey. Um, but as far as the relationship with our family goes, um, yeah, I'd say we we're all pretty close. My sister's probably a little bit more distant, um, but it's more of a personality thing as opposed to an adoptee thing. 
So you mentioned that uh, you actually had a very good relationship with your adoptive family, and uh, I know in your podcast uh, with, I think it was called Dear Asian Americans, that you actually did experience a little bit of racism uh, in Indianapolis. And I guess I kind of wanted to ask you about that. Uh, is it is it becoming more multicultural? Because I think California and Texas probably has a lot more diversified people, right? And maybe more Koreans, or it's just because of more of a family thing, or... Yeah, um, so I guess really quick to just to clarify, uh, Indianapolis is where I currently live. Uh, my hometown is about an hour and a half north of Indianapolis, much smaller, much more conservative. And yeah, in my hometown um, is where, I, not from my family, but just just from being different than a predominantly white community, uh, I did experience a lot of, of, not a lot, but very subtle ra ra racism um, and things like that. So things like your normal jokes about your eyes, you know, where are you from? You know, I, I, I experienced that in a way that me growing up, I was kind of oblivious to. I didn't really understand at the time what was happening. Um, but even just growing up in that surrounding area, uh, I, I, there were a few, a, a few instances where it was a little bit more blatant and, you know, I think it's just in that small town, very rural, very, very conservative uh, community and communities um, that that is just very ingrained and systemic there. Um, going to Indianapolis and going to college and, and moving around, you know, like to San Diego, to Houston, that's where I was opened up to a lot more diverse uh, settings, um, especially at Purdue. That's where a lot of Asian people were um, for the first time. Okay. So I wanted to get back a little bit about the Korean camps. I think you're actually not the only Korean adoptee that actually participated in them, but I guess uh, you didn't seem to feel a connection to that. Could you explain a little reason why, or is it just not the time maybe you're too young to process being different than other people? Or? Yeah, um, sorry. Uh, I think it was just um, a, a little bit too young. I think it was just a, a little bit too before I was fully forming the ability to retain those memories and to retain the connection that's necessary, I think, to continue to pursue. Um, and it's not like my parents, after I didn't want to do it, didn't encourage me to do it more or to pursue those things. Uh, I just think the trajectory that my life was on, just growing up in, in that white community, I really wanted to be uh, accepted and involved there. And that didn't include going to culture camps and, and learning about other things. It just involved very social, the, the very social aspect of it. Right now, as an adult, you seem pretty confident. Did any of that uh, racism affected you at all, or uh, how do you feel like you process kind of uh, those feelings? Yeah, I think for a long time, I think it did affect me the entire time. I think it was easy for me to dismiss because. I didn't have anyone else there that really looked like me besides my sister. No one really that looked different to talk to or be a mentor of sorts. Um, I think it was, it always was there under the surface. And, you know, I, I hear, especially with, with the stuff that you guys are doing, a lot of these more negative experiences. And while I never had that overall negative experience, especially with my family, um, I think just as I was growing up and becoming more aware of what racism actually was, and especially directed towards myself being Asian American and starting to develop an understanding of what that looked like, I started to internalize it a lot and hold it inside of me and, and let it affect myself that way. Um, very much from, you know, we, a guide talking about mental wellness and things like that, very much affecting me mentally where I, wasn't, I wouldn't want to talk about it because I would be feeling so down or, or, or on the inside feeling so insecure or depressed that instead of reaching out and seeking help, I kept it inside and, and you know, I never did, I never went as far as self-harm, but I had harmful thoughts. And it took a long time, even post-college, to finally get to a place where I felt comfortable and confident um, to be able not just to talk about it, but to be able to come to grips with what I felt inside and, and then be able to not move past it, but understand it. What actually kind of made you want to actually start talking about this uh, kind of stuff? I know that you mentioned a story that you're listening to a podcast and something about whatever that made you cry. Could you explain a little bit more about that? 
Yeah. Um, so this whole journey for me started about a, uh, probably a month and a half ago. We were watching, my fiance and I were watching Always Be My Maybe on Netflix with Randall Park and Ali Wong. And I remember we were watching it and I was, I turned to her and I was just like, I need to learn more about this part of my life. You know, I, 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 I don't know why, but I just feel like that. So I listened to a lot of podcasts and I went on to like, I searched the, the, cur- the cultural uh, section and I didn't really see any Asian American, anything there. So I just typed in Asian American podcast and dear Asian Americans came up. And so I clicked on that and said, okay, let me listen to this first episode. And the first episode was the guest was a guy named Jonathan Wong. He's a professor at USC. Um, and he also helped found the Asian and Pacific Islander uh, club out there at USC. And at the end of that episode, I, I was really struck by not just the way that they were talking about it, but the, the reason that this podcast existed was, was to share and amplify these stories and voices. And at the end of the episode, they say, reach out, you know, connect. We want to connect with you, uh, uh, the listeners. So I did that. I sent an email to Jonathan and he sent me a study called too white to be Korean, too Korean to be white. Um, it's like about a, it's a study on 12 Korean adoptees who grew up majority in the Midwest. Um, but studying them post-college and how they're, how growing up and things, how they, how they went through self-discovery and what they went through in terms of racism and things like that. And I got to a section in that study about ethnic self-discovery and I cry. It made me cry. It's funny to think about a scientific study making you cry, but it was the first time that I had ever read what I felt I had experienced and, and, and internalized, you know, those feelings of internalization from someone else. I had heard someone who I didn't realize was like me that existed. And then all of a sudden it was, it opened up a door to this community. And from that point, it's just been reaching out to people, reading more, watching more, learning more, and, and doing those things. And everyone's been very welcoming on that journey so far. What actually did, uh, what kind of uh, these experiences and feelings uh, from this podcast that were they actually specifically saying that kind of reached out to you? Was it uh, the, the disconnect between being a, a Korean or American or identity? Is that what was uh, going on with that podcast? Yeah, so it was, yeah, in that study, it was really, um, okay, so the podcast, what specifically stuck with me was how how just easy it was to kind of have this conversation, even though it may not have been easy, you know, to talk about these things, and feeling like I had never heard any Asian American or Korean American, for that, for that matter, um, speak on any of this, and not that there hadn't been people that had ever spoke on it and, and related their stories and experiences, but I had just never been exposed and, and never had sought that out. And so it was just, I think, the very conversational tone of that, of that episode that really made me want to, to reach out to the community. And from there, from the, in the study, it was specifically about the identity discovery part of it. Um, what really stuck out to me was not just them talking about the jokes, you know, that, that, that people always made, but how that those jokes and things specifically made them feel and how they reacted to those feelings, which was what I had done. And what I've learned now, a lot of Korean American adoptees go through is that internalization. I don't really have anyone to talk to, you know, I have, my family might be all right, but you know, it's not something I discuss with them because it's, to them, it's still an alien and foreign situation. So it was really the fact that the, these, this group of people had come to grips with their identity in this way and have had time to reflect on it that made me realize, man, I'm 30, and I have never once reflected on this or thought about it. And I decided that I, w- I wanted to start doing those things. So I know you were uh, involved like heavily with sports and maybe extra, extracurricular activities when you are younger. Did you actually feel included when you were younger then, or did you were you like extroverted and able to interact with people? I mean, you described some complex feelings maybe, but it, it it sounds like you interacted well with people, maybe possibly, or maybe you were kind of faking it with with uh, with your team. Or can you describe a little bit about that? Yeah, um, it did. It, it, so when I was really young, it took me a long time, I think, to come out of my shell. Um, you describe yourself as shy then, actually, then maybe you're. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely back then. I- I'm a little less shy now, but definitely back then, uh, a lot more shy, especially in grade school, what K through five. Um, once I got to middle school, you know, I had developed a, a, a friendships and things with, with some people. And then sports was really what connected me. Not that I was like a great athlete or anything, but I was all right. And I ended up, I played basketball, I played football, and I ran track. And I, it was there where I started to feel a little bit of, of a sense of community. However, um, especially in basketball, so this is like around 2005, right when Yao Ming had, had come to the NBA. And so me being the only Asian person, especially playing basketball, like that's the joke that I got constantly. And it's one of, it was one of those situations where I was like, I didn't really like that people were calling me that, but I just said, you know, make the joke before they do, and then they'll stop making the joke. I don't really think that that happened. I think that they thought it was fine to then continue with that. But, I mean, as far as sports go, that was really the only thing that made me feel different or, or other or away from the group. Other than that, I felt pretty accepted when it, comes to, when it came to sports, only because I performed well uh, for the most part. Um, I, don't, I think if I would not have been as athletic as I was at that point in time, that it might have, that might, could have gone a different route, um, especially in terms of, you know, not feeling accepted or, or not being able to socialize based on athletic achievement. Yeah, I know that you said that you're like the, I can't remember the ranking you were in school. It was like pretty up at like 16th. Were you pretty smart then or, or uh, uh, how, how, were, how were you with the studies? I, was, I wasn't too bad. I think I, I had, I like to learn but I don't necessarily think that school was the best setting. I did well all the way up to high school, and then in high school, it's just slowly dropping off. But in high school, especially at this, uh, at this small rural school, the drop-off from you know being in the top to just being in the top 10 or 15 was not, was not like a huge anything. So um, I wouldn't say I was the most intelligent person, but you know I, I did all right. What struck me is that you said your class, your class was like out of a hundred, right? Was that correct? Or yeah, it was really yeah. small. So you must have went like an extremely small school. My brother and I end up going to school like with a, a high school with four hundred people, but with you, it must have been extremely, extremely small with you. With you. Yeah, yeah, we were one of the smaller schools in the community, or in, not in the community actually. My fiance went to a school uh, in a town right over or just east of where I live. And her school is like probably twice as small as what ours was. So it wasn't like we were the smallest, but you know, we're from, we're really from that rural area. I know you guys are from Minnesota. Um, and I know they have certain pockets of that, uh, around, but we didn't grow up next to like Indianapolis or Fort Wayne, the bigger metropolises, uh, in the state. So yeah, we, we uh, came up in that small that, that small city city life. And I guess I was kind of leading off to, so it, was it a, a kind of a cultural shock when you moved and went to a different school that had a lot more, in a different city that had a lot more diversity? Uh, could you explain a little bit more about that? Oh, yeah, definitely. Culture shock is a great way to describe it. Um, you know, I, was re- I think I was ready for, uh, for it to be different, but I didn't, I couldn't have imagined, you know, all the different colors, shapes, sizes, everything that's out there in the world. And that's only going, you know, four hours away from where, from my hometown to be able to, to get exposed to that type type of diversity. So my first year, my first semester of college, I went to Ball State, which is in Muncie, Indiana. And even at that point, it was, you know, being exposed to just like, just the culture around uh, around being an adult now, you know, getting out of high school, getting out of your parents' house. Um, but then, yeah, just learning about not only me being different and my, my identity, but then learning about all these other cultures' identities, you know, learning about African-American identity, learning about indigenous people, Native American identity, um, and getting exposed to these, to these other groups of people um, it was really, really eye opening, you know, just, just having came from where I came from. So generally, did you gravitate, uh, more, uh, people of, uh, different skin colors or maybe different cultures or still, did you make a lot of American white friends or Caucasian friends or, uh, I made more Caucasian friends. I still, I still have a lot of the same circle of friends, uh, that I had from that time. 
Um, I'd say I gravitated a lot to the cultures of other, of other ethnicity cultures. Um, and I, it, I, I, I have no problem making friends. Um, it was just, I don't know. I, it was really the crowd that I ran around with. Not that they didn't want to make friends with other people of people of color. It was just, it was just if you gra- if you came into our circle, then you know, then it was like, yes, we have no problem accepting whoever it is. Um, but other than that, it wasn't really. We didn't do a lot to diversify uh, our crowd. I guess I should say. So, did you come across any uh, Korean adoptees around this time at all, or or no? Not adoptees. Um, Korean Americans, a lot of international students, especially at Purdue, uh, they have a lot of. Um, like Chinese and Korean Amer- or Korean international students come over for engineering and things like that at Purdue. Um, and I met, I met a lot of people of Asian descent there, but I did not befriend a lot of people of Asian descent there, um, mainly due to the language barrier, but a lot to do with my own insecurities of trying to befriend someone who comes from authentic Asia from the authentic Eastern countries where I'm very, in my mind, inauthentic as an Asian person, because I don't know the language. I don't eat the food. You know, I, I, I don't go into those groups. So for me, uh, it was still very in that, in that mode of being dismissive, I guess, towards some of that, uh, you know, discovery. So you actually don't do you like eat kimchi or or, or anything or or uh, anything Korean now or you just kind of get in into it? I'm getting I'm getting into it. I've had kimchi before. I've had bibimbap. Um, bagolgi. Bagolgi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you like do you like it? Do you like that kind of food or? Yeah, I I I've, I've, I've always kind of been not had like I've always had an affinity for any kind of food. And at least trying something once. I, I say I'll always try something once. So uh, right now my sister has actually got a Korean cookbook, and she's learning how to cook a lot of Korean food. So I'm waiting for her to get done with that so I can get that and then start going about it myself. So on the podcast, I remember you were talking about that you weren't that close to your, your sister, but uh, over time you guys became kind of close. So you actually didn't really feel that closer, even though she was a Korean adoptee. Uh, you got, you didn't identify maybe because she has a different gender, or could you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, I don't think it was the genders that kept us, you know, from from connecting uh, as siblings and especially as adoptees. Um, I honestly think it was how we how we were placed in school that had a lot to do with that. Um, so despite only being two years apart in age. We were four years apart in grade. So I was a grade, I didn't get moved ahead of grade, but because of where my birth date fell, I was put in the, in whatever class that was that was ahead. And where her birth date fell, she was placed in the class that was behind or, or that came that following year. So when I was a senior, she was a freshman. Um, and along with that, she was, not introverted, but she, we had different interests, uh, I guess, especially in school. She's a lot more studious than me. Um, and then, you know, she was off doing her own thing. I was off doing my own thing with sports and with my friends. Um, and we just never really overlapped in a way where we just sat down and would talk about stuff, um, especially what we might be going through uh, at that time from a race standpoint. Um, so yeah, like I said, in the podcast, it wasn't until she had graduated from college that we really started to sit down and have those conversations and build a sibling relationship. Um, even outside of being adopted, was it because you guys started talking about your adoption or being from Korea or was it uh, other things? It was, it was other things at first. Um, we did, we did though, start talking, having conversations about, you know, growing up in our hometown and what we, what we faced and what we felt on an individual level, you know, cause it, I, I heard stuff from my mom about kind of things that she may have gone through. Um, and I'm sure she heard from my mom things that I may have gone through, but it's not the same as us talking about it. You know, it, it's not the same as getting it firsthand. So it was really, it's been really nice even to this day to now have those conversations and to be able to open up about, Hey, you know, what we, some of the stuff that we experienced wasn't that great. That, that wasn't really right. Especially some things that you went through. You know, I, 
I'm sorry I wasn't there more and I didn't talk to you more to get through that, you know? Um, so connecting on that level has been um, a blessing, for, especially from where we were, where we came from. So with your adoptive family, uh, you guys have a pretty good uh, communication wise. You guys like can talk about these things with each other or could you describe a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so we, we, we definitely can now. I think that growing up, it wasn't ever something that we wanted to talk about, you know, us as kids maybe wanted to talk about with our parents and maybe even for our parents, it may have been difficult or just, just something that they didn't understand how to talk to us about. Um, but, you know, as we've gotten older and as we've gotten more into like politics, my sister and I are very, we lean left where our parents, you know, especially where we came from, you know, have, have, grown, have grown up in a very conservative, yeah, very conservative Republican town um, and state. And, you know, we clash on, on ideologies uh, regarding that. But even in those clashes, I think something that, that was born out of that was the ability to start talking about, you know, things that we went through in school that we never talked about before. This is 20 years down the line now where we can where we're starting to have these conversations. And we've always been able to talk to our parents. You know, they, they love us. They want to have conversations just like anybody's parents after their kids go to college. You know, they're like, well, we want to talk to you. And it's like, mom, leave me alone. I'm, I'm doing my own thing. But, you know, it, it's just now recently where we've been able to start having these conversations. And especially around the, the, the COVID. Yeah, what's happening in, in, with COVID and, and then what's being exposed now about the systemic issues and oppression, especially in the black community, but even for us as Asian Americans in America, um, being able to talk with them about that and getting them to at least start to acknowledge and understand, you know, why these things have been happening has been really, has been really amazing in my eyes to see my parents go through a transformation of understanding and acceptance and to be willing to have the conversation and not only admit if they had been wrong, but to be willing to admit that this is something we should be talking about anyways, and that should be talked about more often in, in the wider world of things. I find with politics and stuff, it just be, gets really heated that you can't really talk at all, and it's kind of... Yeah. It, it, it must be an okay table talk between you and your parents, even though you guys have different ideologies, huh? Yeah, it, it's, all, it, it's usually okay. We, we, you can usually pump the brakes if it starts to get a little bit too uh, rough, I guess. I'll Do say. they agree with Trump? Um, they did. Oh, I see. Uh, I don't think they do anymore. I'm pretty sure we, I'm pretty sure that they've, that, that he's done enough to kind of show that that's not maybe the route that we should be going. So that, that's been a nice transformation to see as well. Do you actually identify with the Black Lives Matter of being persecuted or you actually think they actually have generally dealt with it worse, uh, because you're Asian and you're not black? I mean, I identify with the movement to the extent uh, to the extent that I'm able to identify with it. I'm behind it all the way just because, I mean, not only doing research and learning about the history of it, you know, 400 years of oppression and slavery in this country built on the backs of the uh, of enslaved people. Um, you can we're literally watching it now on on TV and on on social media. Um and I've, uh, you know, it, it's something, especially with coming in, growing up in a very conservative town and a conservative state, you know, it took me a long time to be able to, to, to be able to understand and to be able to begin to understand that struggle. And the thing that's crazy about it to me specifically is the fact that I'm learning, I'm, I'm learning now a lot more about the Asian American struggle in America and you know, Asians being enslaved to build railroads across the country. And then in 45 uh, or, or in the 40s during World War II with the internment camps for the Japanese people. And you got to imagine that, you know, even if there were Chinese or Korean people, they were getting put in those camps as well. Um, and so I, I can I identify with it up to that point that I can from that perspective. But I absolutely support everything that's going on with what they're trying, what, what they're trying to fight for. Because at the end of the day, it's not a pull. It is political because you know we need politics to enforce and change these policies uh, that that perpetuate uh, a lot of these issues. But 
I I fully agree that it's a hum it's it's a it's a human it's a human thing. Just like in your human stories, it's it's the story of humanity and how we as a as a group of of people as a whole group of people are able to confront these things and look ourselves in the mirror and admit yes there is oppression that that permeates through all of our systems social educational otherwise in this country um and being able to admit that and admit that there have been mistakes made not just by our generation but by the generations that come before us um and, and understanding that you know if we're gonna if we're gonna change anything you know we have to we have to change our mindset first so that's to the extent of the black lives matter movement that i i can uh, i can relate to i relate all the way up to that point and then i also firmly stand behind them um when it comes to amplifying their voices amplifying our own voices and fighting for the change that i think that i think and i think every, a lot of people think needs to happen so do you actually believe in the white the white privilege and you actually uh feel like uh you struggle being an asian male uh compared to a, a white male uh i do believe in white privilege i so i come from a family who achieved what a lot of people would describe as the american dream where they where our grandparents made it to a point where they could provide for their families, their kids, and their kids' kids, and their kids' kids, um, to the point where you didn't need to go, our, that part of the family didn't need to go through a struggle. And so I grew up very much with white privilege. And that's something that I didn't understand for a long time, what privilege actually was. Um, and so I, I don't think that I struggled the same as an Asian, an, another Asian American or another Korean adoptee in the same way who grew up, who would, who, who came up in a worse situation than I did. I grew up very much. I, I mean, that's not, I'm not discounting anything that I went through any mental struggles or any racism that I dealt with, but I know I had it a lot better than a lot of Korean adoptees who didn't end up in a good home, who didn't end up in a community who at least who, if they didn't accept them, at least tolerated them, you know, where they were a pariah in that situation. So as far as that goes, I, I do believe in white privilege because I grew up in it and I, I lived it. And I do believe that there are a lot of people out there that did not or have not benefited in the ways that I have um, as Korean adoptee. Your family really wealthy then or? or they, they did well for themselves. Okay. Yeah, they, 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 they did well for themselves. My grandfather, uh, he, he started and then built up the cable company in our hometown. And then that eventually spread out to a few surrounding towns as well. So just as a, as just as a small business owner growing into kind of a, just a businessman in his own right, um, they were just able to do a lot of work. Um, and then they were just very frugal and smart with their money and things like that to set up their family to be in a position to not have to go through the, the same struggles that, that a lot of families have to deal with. Um, coming from the middle and lower classes. So you're talking about your family is like really conservative. Uh, how about the city itself or Indiana and Apples? Are they generally uh, okay with the LGBTQ community or they are still kind of, do they have a negative viewpoint of, the, of that kind of uh, social group? Indiana, yeah, Indiana is, is really kind of, I think is trending more towards the middle now. Um, growing up, you know, that was something that, got made fun of very easily. And that's just even the 90s and the early 2000s and things like that when I was a kid. It's a very American, Indianapolis is like a, 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 a very yeah, American the stereotype. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I'm sure you guys know our vice president now, Mike Pence, was the governor of Indiana for quite some time. And this man, not only on top of being very religious, is very anti-LGBTQ. Um, and so he had instituted uh, policies and stuff that that negated their ability to, to live and thrive and to be recognized as people. And luckily after he left, there was a lot of repeals. Um, I know when I first was in Indianapolis, there was a, there was a very strong push um, to normalize or to not only legalize the uh, gay marriage, but also to, for them to not be refused service in stores and stuff like that, because that was a huge issue uh, going through Indiana at that time. Um, I can't say that it's not still an issue, but I do think, especially in Indianapolis, um, a city of, of a lot more diverse 
background and culture um, ha- has really made good strides in- in- towards that uh, of being a lot more accepting of uh, the LGBTQ community. So I guess we can go a little bit uh, uh, with your struggles. You, did you have mental health issues uh, that probably may be related to your uh, adoption at all? Or can you describe a little bit? Yeah. Um, yeah. So nothing. I, was, I never went to therapy. I never went and saw anyone. I was never diagnosed with anything. However, I do think, especially with the benefit of hindsight, that I did, I have struggled with a lot of that, especially depression um, and especially with internalizing those feelings. Um, you know, it, it's been, it's on this journey of, uh, that I'm on right now that I've been on for the last month and a half, it's really been a reckoning of my own insecurities that I've dealt with. So that study, um, one of the things that really stood out to me and that really made me, you know, think about identity specifically um, was the fact that they talked about or, or and how that, that affects you was they talked about abandonment being one of those underlying issues with adoptees that causes a lot of this uh, negative mental emotions and things like that. And I, that's something I never thought of before. And so going back and, and replaying my life and, and growing up and thinking, man, why was I so angry at this stuff all the time? Why did I feel so sad? Why did I have such wild mood swings from happy to sad and, and things like that? I think I can really trace it to this this feeling of abandonment that I never knew existed inside of me um, that has always been there because, it, you know, especially being a part of Guide now and, and reading stuff that Moses has written, speaking with Derek and, and listening to, like, Jody talk, um, it's, really, it's, it's really been eye-opening for me to understand how being taken, forcibly removed from our home country, our home culture, our home, our identity, our identities really sets the table for how those mental, for how your mental well-being develops, even over not only the course of your childhood, but especially over the course of your teens and into your adulthood. Um, so yeah, especially looking back on my life now, I do think that I, I, I dealt with a lot of different struggles um, mentally that I never have really reckoned with and, and I'm only starting to kind of deal with now. Um, I, I have a lot, I, I thank my fiance a lot for being someone who has accepted me for who I am. And especially when it comes to that dealing with that side of my personality, you know, being willing to roll with the punches and, and be like, we're going to get through this. Let's, let's talk it out. Let's figure it out. So um, she's really been somebody that that's been a rock for me in that in that in that sense. So she's been actually helping you quite a bit with kind of your your accepting your Korean ness, I guess. So I was wondering, uh, before this, did uh, any of this identity and uh, identity issues and abandonment issues did that uh, kind of bleed into your relationships, and did it make it difficult to to hold them, or if you you're willing to share a little bit about that? Yeah, I think it. I think it did bleed into my relationships um, a little bit. I think it was hard for me for a long time to, I guess, not form a relationship and be in a relationship, but to sustain um, over the long term. Um, I think it was a lot of, and it was it was being unable to to vocalize what what, what I felt inside um, and how I was feeling about that, and then also not understanding that that was what was making me either sabotage a relationship or drive a wedge in between uh, the two of us. Um, so, and, and, and then again, that's something I think that my, that uh, my fiance now has been really great about is just not just accepting it, but, you know, working through it with me. And also we, it was just a perfect timing thing of where I'm now a little bit better and more equipped to talk about stuff out in the open. And she's not only a great listener, she's a teacher um, and, you know, who is great in social settings. So she's been a very big help in, in being able to continue to have that conversation. And then what, what failed me in my previous relationships was just not being able to, to vocalize that at all. And now being able to vocalize it a little and having someone who's able to, to read that and see that and hear it and then be able to to continue and want to continue with the conversation. What's your uh, 
gonna be wives. <laughs> Your fiance, what, what is what? What's her uh, nationality then, or, or her race? Or... Yeah, she's Caucasian. She's uh, she's white. Did you generally d date white people, or for the most part, yeah. So you didn't find any connection with Asian woman, maybe, or or no? Not really, no. I th and that's again something to going back to my days at Purdue specifically because there were a lot of Asian people, you know, international students there. Um, that goes back to my just being hanging out with that same crowd and, and being very comfortable with that and not not thinking about pursuing it. You know, like what could have, what could my prospects have been if I went in that direction? It's just not something that didn't even really cross my mind. So, you know, I, I'm too far now at that point to think <laughs> to to wonder what I could have done. I can't I can't go back and do it now, but. Um, yeah, there's just something that I never really honestly ever thought about. I guess I wanted to ask you that because I mainly dated Asian people. And I guess I was kind of asking about whether you more identify with white people or Asian people. Because I, I mainly, the people that I actually hung around with and my brother eventually during college, it was kind of the cultural shock. We actually hung around Hmong people. I don't know if you know Hmong people in your area or... I don't know any, no, but... okay. Yeah, they're a big, really Asian race, and since there wasn't a lot of Korean adoptees, I kind of identified with them, and I ended up dating more of those uh, type of women. Uh, do you believe there's a, kind of a crutch being an Asian uh, American versus a white person trying to find relationships? So, what's your opinion on that? Um, I don't. I, w I guess I wouldn't necessarily say. I don't necessarily think it's a crutch. Um, I think, or maybe like, maybe a slight hindrance. Um, and, and yeah, in, in some situations, um, again, I guess and when it comes to relationships for me personally, it's been a lot of it for me is insecurity. Um, and it did a little bit of that did have to do with being, you know, looking different than, than a lot of white people. Um, and especially, you know, as I was been, a, been attracted to mostly white women and, and things like that. You know, that I always in the back of my mind knew that that was probably an obstacle to be overcome in, in those pursuits. Um, but to your question right before that about what I identify with more, um, I do think, you know, even in those pursuits, uh, I do identify or I did for a long time identify more with white America as opposed to any Asian America uh, or Asian American culture or race or anything like that. Um, and I do think that actually when you said that, I, I hadn't thought of it like that, but that did bleed a lot into, you know, what I pursued and looked for in a relationship. Um, just because, you know, growing up where I grew up and, and with the people that I, I was with and who I hung around with even after that uh, definitely informed, you know, what I guess my thoughts and my thinking on that and what I was, uh, you know, what I was trying to do and what I was looking for in a relationship. And, it really wasn't until all after all of that that I started to be like, I'm not. I, why am I basing it off of this? Why am I basing who I who I go after off of these these you know worthless prerequisites? I guess I should say, um, or, or holding myself back in any way. Okay. Yeah. It's there, so we were talking with our kimchi club today. A lot of them are talking about kind of going an identity crisis, but it sounds like you're actually working towards finding your own identity. Uh, could you explain a little bit more? Uh, with Guide, I know they asked you to be uh, the curator for Guide and also uh, kind of a news anchor with Guide as well. What other things have you been trying to do with coming to terms with your Koreanness and all the struggles that you had to deal with? Yeah, so the main thing that I'm trying to do is just reach out to as many people as possible who will be willing to sit down and talk to me. Um, I think that's been the, the number one thing that's really kept me going and because I, I really jumped really headfirst into this uh, without a plan, it just to, to learn as much as I possibly could. And the best thing about this entire journey so far has been how open and receptive everyone has been, all of these Korean Americans, even Asian Americans to, to what I'm going or what not what I'm going through, but what my personal journey has been so far. And that's really every time that I speak to someone new, I, I, I email someone and they respond, you know, a week later, it just reinforces that not only have I found this journey at the right time, but that this was the point that I needed to do that at. Um, and so, yeah, like with Guide, uh, that was just me. I, I came across the organization. Um, I was put in touch uh, uh, to an article about Moses 
And then I looked up guide on, online and I saw the contact email and I just emailed them. I was like, how can I help it? And how can I get involved in this? And Debbie, she responded to me and the vol- one of the volunteer coordinators. Um, and we talked and then her, I, and Derek talked, uh, got on a zoom call and talked. And then that's what led to the researcher role and now doing the curation for the city hall building. That's what I've been doing for that. Um, which is just, I'm looking at every group on Facebook. Um, we're looking at nonprofit organizations, the also known as, uh, chapters across the country. Um, and that's just me pulling all of those things so we can get them in the city hall, figuring out which ones we want, what we got to get rid of, um, and consolidating all those groups. And then from the news perspective, you know, the biggest thing for me, and this is something that Derek told, talked to me about was, you know, the anchors not only have to be researchers first, but the researchers and the curators are going to be the experts on the things that they're talking about. And that's one of the things that I'm not yet. And, and, and that's something that I'm trying, I aspire to, and I want to do and become. And so, like, with the anchor position, you know, I have a lot of work to do to, to even get to a point where I could be, like, an understudy to whoever whoever these first anchors are, are eventually going to be. Um, and that that is another thing that is really fueling my desire to want to do this is the fact that I am a novice. I, I'm, a, I'm a 10 seconds out of the womb, new baby Korean-American adoptee, and I, I have so much to learn that it's, you know, it's like I'm starting completely over um, from from this knowledge standpoint. What do you actually do for a job right now? Yeah, so um, I, uh, I work at a local animal clinic. I work in the call center. Um, uh, I actually just started doing that. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, my main goal is to find work in administration in a nonprofit. Um, I actually, my sister and I founded a nonprofit in Chicago last year. And I'm still doing the program for that and doing all of that. Um, but just as a, my full-time job, I, I'm just working this call center stuff. And, you know, it's something that I've done. I've done customer service for a long time. I don't want to just sit at an entry-level position, but, you know, it, it, it allows me time to work on stuff for guide. It allows me time to work on the other pursuits that I have going on, uh, including the nonprofit. So. Did you ever thought that you end up being some sort of news host or radio host or... Was that just given you on your lap, or how did that come to be? So when I was at Purdue, I actually wrote sports for the Purdue, it's called The Exponent, the paper there. Um, but I always, I've always had people tell me that I have a voice for radio, whatever that means. And I, I never thought that that was something I'd ever do. You never thought about being a sports, you never thought about being a sports broadcaster? Because I think you'd fit it. Uh I mean, I, I guess I've thought about it, but never seriously thought about it, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I guess with this, with this anchor role with Guy, that was just, you know, uh, uh, when I first talked to Derek, it's something that he saw that I could potentially fill. So, I mean, that's something we're still evaluating. Like, you know, like I said, I, I really think it, it takes an expert to sit, sit in that chair, that anchor chair, to be able to properly and appropriately relay the Korean adoptee news that we're trying to to talk about, you know? So it, even if it's not me, um, I'm totally okay with that. I, I'm willing to do it. And, you know, if I can get to that point where I, I am able to, to talk about it in the way that it needs to be talked about, I'm happy to sit in that chair and do that. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I think anybody that we get that comes in and wants to fill that role, you know, we, we have to have that expectation of, you got, we got to know what we're talking about when, when we sit up there and deliver the news. So I, I'm still trying to get to that point. Um, so we'll see. We'll, we'll see what happens. I know you play, played sports, but are you really into watching a lot of sports as well? Or Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big Chicago Cubs fan. I really like baseball. Um, I don't really have many professional sports teams besides them that I'm a, I'm, I would say I'm a diehard fan of. Uh, I'm a diehard fan of Purdue sports, though. I, football, baseball, basketball. I even like the track team, so I uh, like to stay up on that. My, so I've been keeping a little track of how long we've been doing these interviews, and I can't believe it's already been an hour. So we'll try to kind of wrap it up. I wanted to talk more about your adoption story. Uh, so do you know your, your, your Korean name at all, or, or, or do you have a story at all? Yeah, so the Korean name, I guess, that was given to me at either the orphanage or the agency that I, that I was in in Korea 
was Young Jin Kim, which I guess in Korean means bright star. I don't know if that's a fa- familial name or, but I guess the story is that that was given to me by uh, whoever the, the wet nurse or the adoptive mother or whatever uh, over there in Korea was. How old were you uh, when you came to, to, to the United States then? Three months. Three- okay, so we're really young then. So have you ever thought about learning the Korean language at all or, or no? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually very interested in learning it. Um, I've dabbled in like a Duolingo class like the app and did a little bit of that but i just didn't really feel like it was it was uh like taking in my mind so i, I would like to i would like to sit down with someone who could potentially tutor me in that and, and to learn that um i know it's it's difficult to get a, a grip on um especially you know coming at, at 30 uh as opposed to doing it when you're growing up um, but if I could get a little bit of it down, I'd, I'd be happy with that. Do you have this need to uh, find your birth family? Do you feel like it's a missing piece? And do you plan going to Korea anytime soon? Or um, For a long time, I didn't. I uh, honestly was actively almost against it, maybe. Not because of any animosity towards them, but just for me, I didn't see what benefit it would bring me. Um, but as I've gotten older, really, I would be interested in finding out more about them from the health perspective, because I don't know anything about, you know, uh, any of those inherent health issues that I may come up as I get older. Uh, but my family and I are actually have been, been planning a trip to Korea um, with my sister and her husband as well for um, a while. We're in the beginning stages of that plan, and especially with COVID now, uh, we don't really know what that's going to look like. But my sister's been back before, not on a birth search, but just a visit. Um, so got a little familiarity there with the travel. But I, I'm, I would like to go, and I, I do think that I have started a birth search with Bethany Christian Services. That was the adoption agency I came through, um, and now I just got to get the necessary paperwork filed to them and pay whatever that fee or whatever it is to get that really, really off the ground. But that's where I'm at right now with that. Have you ever thought about doing like a 23andMe test, or are you going to wait and see how this uh, adoption agency goes with your search? Uh, I actually have been thinking about doing a 23 and me. I think I'm probably going to do one here pretty soon. Okay. I think we're going to cut it off for, uh, right now. Um, I'm trying to keep it under an hour. So we had a lot to talk about. Um, uh, is there any other things that you'd like to address? Actually, what nonprofit do you actually uh, work for right now? I think that's been kind of your thing. Yeah. Um, I appreciate you asking. Uh, we founded a nonprofit in Chicago last year called the All Times or Local Foundation. What we do is we are there to bridge the digital divide between older foster youth and communication and resources. And so we have a program called Phones for Fosters where we provide older foster youth, so 17 to 21, with cell phones, unlimited data, uh, and some insurance on those devices for two years. And then the cool thing that kind of sets us apart from other organizations or the other organization that does something similar is we try to make a, a human connection with them. So uh, rec- prerequisites for being in the uh, remaining eligible in the program, you got to answer a general survey about foster care, your experience in foster care every three months. And then every six months, we actually sit down. I sit down and speak with them either over the phone or in person and have like what we're doing right now, uh, just talking about their life, their experience in foster care, you know, what was good, what was bad. And then we use all of that data to one day uh, either push policy or go to the DCFS and be like, hey, you know, we've had somebody who was placed 26 times. I think there's something going on with your system that we need to correct. Um, so that's something that, that that's what we do, uh, something I'm really passionate about. Um, we launched our program last August. Um, we're right around 50 uh, kids right now that we've gotten enrolled uh, over this first year. Um, so I'm really proud of that. And right now we're working on uh, what community outreach and fundraising things that we really need to start solidifying in that area to make sure not only can we sustain in Chicago, but we can go to every other city that we can get to as well. So do you actually generally have a pretty good uh, 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 political opinion on adoption? I know there's people that really hate adoption. They think it's human trafficking, but like you and my brother and... Uh, we had pretty good adoption experiences. Uh, what's your viewpoint on that? Yeah, I think, you know, I think it's a really, I think it's a really tough topic to, 
to find that middle ground. So for international adoption, I think that you have to look at the systems where those kids are getting adopted from, you know, and for domestic adoption, it's the same thing. Like we have to take a look at why, why kids are being placed in foster care to be adopted, why they're being removed. We have to look at who, like what, what is the, what's the funding situation going on there and why are we not adequately staffing uh, these services and organizations and resources? Um, why are we not doing appropriate checks and background checks on potential foster parents? You know, it, it's a lot of these horror stories. It's after you've already been in the system and have been placed, and then, you know, it, it goes straight downhill from there. And I think that there is human trafficking that does happen, and I do think that at some point, the foster care system in some way is being wrapped up into that. I don't, I have not done enough research uh, to, to say that is definitively what is happening. Um, and then again, there, like you just said, you know, there's experiences like we've had or so, some of the people that I'm working with that have had very positive experiences. And it's like, okay, if we changed adoption and, and got rid of it, what's happening to those people that end up in those good situations, you know, it's so I think it's a really difficult to, to get from here to there and, and then get to the middle of both of those things. So I think it, it's really, you know, it's up to your opinion. I think everyone's entitled to that opinion. Um, but I think we at the end of the day, it's just we all need to take a look at these systems in place that 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 run adoption and run foster care and say, what do we need to do differently? So was it with Guide that you actually first met uh, Korean adoptees, or did you actually meet Korean adoptees before Guide? Uh, yeah, so Guide was, uh, yeah, the first time that I've actually personally met and made connections and, and what are turning into friendships with, with actual ado Korean adoptees, yeah. So you've been actually meeting a lot of Korean adoptees and actually finding a connection, you'd say? Yeah, um, definitely through Guide and definitely through all the Facebook groups and, and stuff that I've been researching. And then through that podcast, Dear Asian Americans, um, to the, the other two Korean adoptees that were on the show before me, um, I'm actually working with them, and we're working on a podcast together uh, now as well, kind of about the adoptee journey, but basically looking at adoption, a Korean adoption through the lens of three, got, three people at different points in their journey of, of, ex, of uh, discovering their identity. So I'm pretty excited about that as well. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, so it sounds like you're going to do your own podcast maybe show in the future. Yeah, we're, 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 we're working on it. We're, we're trying to see, you know, what, what might be the best routes to take with it. So we'll see what comes of it. Yeah. All right. Thanks again, Patrick, uh, for talking with us. Uh, time certainly goes fast. Uh, it's already been an hour, more than an hour right now. But we appreciate your time, and uh, we hope to talk to you soon. Absolutely. No problem, guys. Thanks for having me on, and I'm sure we'll be working together soon.